Hey guys, what's up and welcome back to my channel. So today we're going to be talking about a topic that truly had me a little bit flabbergasted when I first came across it. Now you know how sometimes you're scrolling on Twitter and you come across these random tweets that are referring to something very specific but they don't put anything necessarily too indicative of what that is. I'll put the tweet up on the screen if I can find it again but I came across this tweet that was like I can't believe that one guy who killed his entire family had his obituary posted and people are basically complimenting him saying how much they're gonna miss him or saying how much of a good person he was. Now obviously when you read that if your feet are on the ground you're gonna be like okay what the fuck here is where I come in. So I was like okay I need to find out about this surely I'm gonna lose more faith in humanity because how how in the hell whom like is writing these these nice messages to a whole family murderer? Bizarre obituary praises Utah dad Michael Height who killed wife, five kids. A glowing obituary for a Utah man who allegedly killed his entire family in a murder-suicide plot said he made it a point to spend quality time with each and every one of his children as an online fundraiser bizarrely replaces him with an image of Jesus in a family photo. Replacing anyone with a picture of Jesus in a family picture, unless it's a joke, is alarming. Police believe Michael Height, 42, gunned down his wife, Tasha Height, with their three daughters, ages 17, 12, and 7, and two sons ages seven and four on January 4th, two weeks after she had filed for divorce, officials said. Also killed in the Enoch City Massacre was his mother-in-law, Gail Earl, 78. But an obit published in the Spectrum did not mention the killings and painted an angelic picture of the shooter saying he exceeded at everything he did after graduating from high school in 1998 as a sterling scholar in business he achieved the rank of Eagle Scout, the tone-deaf piece said. Michael spent the summer after graduation working in Alaska in a fish processing plant. His leadership skills, values, and honest work and determination quickly led him to be a line manager and over a crew of 10 to 12 men, it said. Michael was called and served a full-time mission into Brazil for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the abit continued. Height was said to have met his future wife during their time at Southern Utah University, where he was named the Outstanding Finance student. Now, I went to go check the obituary myself. From what I can understand, I think the website shut down the possibility to comment. The obituary itself was gone. I'm also going to put the full obituary on the screen in a second. You can pause to read so you can see everything. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here because already the Church of Latter-day Saints, there are things to be said. Now, to be very clear, most churches, most religions have their scandals, have their points of weakness to say the very least. So I'm not going to go in that particular direction here because there's no reason for me to believe as of right now that that is central. All I am going to say is that LDS, there's a lot to look into there. So this continues the obituary. They were married in the St. George Temple on May 10th, 2003. Together they welcomed five children into their family. May Seelin, Briley Ann, Ammon, I don't know if I'm mispronouncing that, Michael, Sienna Biel, and Gavin Drew, the abit said. Each of these children were a truly cherished miracle to them, it added. Michael made it a point to spend quality time with each and every one of his children. Michael enjoyed making memories with the family. It also said that the dad lived a life of service. Whether it was serving the church or in the community, he was willing to help with whatever was needed, the abit read. Meanwhile, a GoFundMe account set up by the family bizarrely replaced height with Jesus in a family photo. The fundraiser, which doesn't mention height, had raised $95,000 by Monday morning. I understand the whole don't speak ill of the dead mentality, and there is a Shakespeare quote to back that up from Julius Caesar, if I recall correctly, saying something along the lines of, when men are buried, so often the good they've done is buried with them. That being said, I don't really think it's speaking ill of the dead if you're gonna condemn someone for being a murderer and not only being a murderer, but murdering their entire family, including their children, that's not being mean, that's not being disrespectful, that is being factually correct. Aside from that, in my opinion, if someone did want to say that this person was a piece of shit, 
Would I really stop them from saying that considering what this man did? The answer is no. Their lives were tragically taken too soon. All who knew them loved them so very much, the page reads, adding that the donations will go towards funeral expenses and a memorial fund in honor of the five kids. Listen, okay, this whole thing is really bizarre on so many levels, but the fact that there is this very clear avoidance of mentioning what happened in a way makes sense because you don't want to remind everyone that you're raising money because a guy murdered his family if you want his memory to still be, I don't know, a good memory for him to be cherished. I don't know. Shannon Watts, an activist against gun violence and founder of Moms Demand Action, condemned the fawning a bit and shared a link to it on Twitter while pointing out that none of the obituary comments mentioned the victims. We'll get to that. The activist also shared a link to the family's statement which supported owning firearms. And if that's not gross enough, the wife's family put out a statement supporting guns. This is the type of loss that will continue to occur in families, communities, and this nation when protecting arms are no longer accessible, Watts seethed. One thing I do want to say, and I don't really want to get into gun control here because that's truly not the point of this video. It's a separate conversation that's related, sure, but not what I want to talk about because I don't really feel like I would know enough. We don't really know what else was going on there because as much as gun violence, there's a whole discussion to be had there. I also think we need to count mental health. We also need to count the impact of religion if religion is misinterpreted or if the people who are helping you interpret religion, whether it be your church, the priest, the nuns, whoever is part of the congregation, is helping you interpret it in a way that is unhealthy in the sense of it'll make you act in a violent way, it'll make you think violently. Like there are so many factors here that also contribute that I wouldn't want it to be flattened out to just like, oh, it's bad because he owned guns. Because the reality for me is that guns surely aided. But aside from that, it's like if someone is unwell to the point that they are going to do that to their families, we also have to count that there's a problem beneath just having the gun, right? Enoch Mayer, Jeffrey Chestnut said police were still investigating the motive for the murder-suicide, but they were aware that court records showed Tasha filed for divorce on December 21st, Insider reported. Tasha's sister-in-law, Jenny Earl, told the Associated Press that Michael had removed all guns from the home before the shootings. She said the lack of access to firearms left Tasha Height her mother and children more quote unquote vulnerable. And this to me indicates, okay, why do they feel vulnerable in the sense of, do they feel vulnerable because they're worried about home invasion, which is valid, or do they feel vulnerable because of him? That's why I'm saying this whole gun centric thing doesn't make sense if we don't have more context because otherwise everyone's just guessing something. Police said they had investigated Michael before, suggesting previous problems inside the household. So again, we have another layer, which makes it even more complicated. Let's talk about the obituary for a second. So under Shannon Watts' tweet describing what happened, she did share screenshots of comments under the obituary. I'm gonna read you some of them because this is surreal. Michael was our insurance agent. We drove all the way from St. George to have him help us. He was always kind and good to us and always was willing to lend a helping hand. We don't know the whys and hows, but I do know it's not our right to judge. And the Lord loves Michael very much. May your family be truly blessed at this time. May you find peace and comfort and know he was loved by many. Our family had three generations that love and trusted him. May all the hearts be comforted in both families in this time of sorrow and grief. So listen, I'm not at all related to these people, but I cannot even begin to imagine the type of rage because I feel disgusted reading this, honestly. So first of all, the entire focus being on Michael is sickening because he's the murderer what about the kids? What about his wife? What about the mother-in-law? They're not here because of him. We want to remember that, right? There is something almost comedic in the most disgusting way possible. It's like, okay, he's been your family's insurance agent for three generations. Okay, fine, whatever. It just sounds like people coming from the outside chiming in about something they don't know. It'd be the equivalent of me being like, hey, I sold him a sandwich once and my restaurant's been owned by my family for three generations and I know that he really liked this sandwich and he seemed like a good guy. Why, why must people chime in? Knowing when to shut the fuck up is a great virtue. Michael and his family will be greatly missed. He was always quick with a smile and a kind word. He went out of his way to help and serve other people. He loved his family and was proud of them. 
He took the time to show people that he loved them by serving them. Michael was funny. I don't think I'll ever forget the time we visited the cowboy ghost town and Michael decided to be the wife in the cutouts. I'm grateful for his example of Christ-like love and service, his life and his friendship. I pray that peace and comfort will come to his family left behind with the reassurance that you will be together again one day, sending all my love. These comments truly make me feel like the people writing them, and I don't like to use this very lightly, are absolutely fucking delusional. Because in what world where children, his own children, were murdered, are you wishing peace and remembering fondly how he was a good guy because he wore a girl costume instead of a boy costume? Ha ha. What? We have known Michael since his grade school and baseball days. When he became an insurance agent, we were able to work professionally with him. Eventually, all our children became clients of Michael. He has always been so good to us and so helpful. We will miss him. Best wishes and love to Brenda and all of his family. The other thing is people keep sending wishes to his family, and I'm like, you realize that he killed also, like, a big part of his family, right? Like, his chosen family that was his wife and then his children. He killed them. We're remembering that because these these comments don't seem like anyone's remembering that. Now, I'm not saying they need to go comment that this guy was a piece of shit, but at this point, what are you commenting to say? That he was a good insurance agent? Okay, what is the point? Like, what are you trying to do here? So to give you an idea of the type of mentality going on here that to me is absolutely inconceivable, but you guys can tell me, there's this woman who comments on Shannon's tweet the one talking about this entire case. So this person says, your outside perspective on this one is interesting since I grew up with a family and I'm still connected through social media. We are LDS, Latter-day Saints, the same faith they are. I think the desire to focus on our hopes for a joy-filled afterlife are how we make sense of the indefensible. Which, listen, thinking of the afterlife, thinking of heaven, whatever, totally fine. And Shannon Watts responded as if he deserves a joy-filled afterlife. And then this person says, I don't know what he deserves. I never felt like the hellfire brimstone fear-mongering of major religions is useful. Apparently neither is the idea of joy and love everlasting because look what he did. Shannon Watts responded, I don't believe in hell, but I do believe acting like an abuser wasn't responsible for wiping out his entire family because he had easy access to guns, which will just encourage more of the same. I think as a whole, just focusing on Michael to begin with is the mistake here. So someone else said, reading the his obituary comments made my blood run cold. Everyone just loved their friendly insurance agent, Michael. What a neat guy. Too bad about his wife and kids, but boy was he swell until executing them in cold blood, which is exactly how I felt. It felt ridiculous to read basically reviews on his job as an insurance man. Like, nobody cares about that. And someone responded, the one that hit the most was, we're gonna miss Michael and his family, as if they just moved to another state because he was such a swell agent that, quote, served three generations of our family. Disgusting. And that's really how I feel about all this, where the focus just seems to be in the wrong place, and there just seems to be such a lack of self-awareness in terms of, you realize you're talking about his job as an insurance agent when he killed his entire family? You're focusing on your, what, your insurance policy? Because he got you a good policy? He's like a great guy. I don't understand. You guys can let me know what you think in the comments down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. I thank you to my patrons as always, and I'll catch you guys next time.